much for having us. Good evening, and welcome to another Northshire Bookstore virtual event. My name is David Wood, an event manager here, and I've been really looking forward to tonight's event. But before we get started, a couple of quick notes. Uh, please type any questions that you have into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom, win Zoom window. I'll save those up and pose them for you towards the end of tonight's event. And finally, a note of thanks. Independent book selling is a hard business in the best of times, and so Northshire owns its continued existence to your support, and we are enormously grateful. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce Peter Levitt and Rebecca Nye, Nye uh, translators of the new book, Nyin Mountain, the Immortal Poetry of Three Taoist Women. Peter Levitt is the guiding teacher of the Salt Spring Zen Circle community in British Columbia, and is the author of 10 books of poetry, including Within Within, 100 Butterflies, and Bright Root, Dark Root. He is also the author of Finger Painting on the Moon, Writing in Cre Creativity as a Path to Freedom co-translator and editor with Kazuaki Takahashi of A Flock of Fools, Ancient Buddhist Tales of Wisdom and Laughter, and The Essential Dojin, Writings of the Je Great Zen Master, and the editor of Thich Nhat Hanh's classic, The Heart of Understanding. And in 1989, Levitt received the prestigious Lanin Foundation Award in Poetry. Rebecca Nye is a transmitted Chinese-American Zen master of the Jogye order, scholar, and award-winning algorithm and new media artist. She's got a beautiful painting of hers behind her. Uh, born and raised in China, she came of age in Canada and the United States, and now she serves as the Buddhist chaplain affiliate of Stanford University. Mrs. Nye is also the founding <coughs> abbot of NV Sion Sanctuary, dedicated to unleashing humanity's full potential through artistic expressions and offering systematic training in Eastern wisdom spiritual traditions. Yin Mountain, the immortal poetry of three Taoist women, which you can order from Northshire at the link I just popped into the chat, uh, has been called an epic making endeavor that the brilliance of their translations is breathtaking while susan moon has said how wonderful to meet my long lost sisters of the tang dynasty china mm -hmm. their voices cross many hundreds of years and many thousands of miles to reach me they speak to me of their struggle for recognition as women of their love of the natural world of their commitment to a spiritual path and they inspire me with both their courageous assertions of autonomy and their longings for connection. Big thanks to the translators for this great gift. While Norman Fisher, whom I had the great pleasure of hosting for a virtual event for his book, When You Greet Me, I Bow, says that ever since Ezra Pound quote unquote discovered Chinese poetry for the English speaking world, the strange and delicate allure of this subtle tradition has been part of our culture. After about a century of translation of important male poets, we can now see in this beautifully translated volume inversions that are in their fullest sense lovely, the other side of the coin. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire Bookstore, Peter Levitt and Rebecca Nye. Why don't you all take it away? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Peter, where do you want to start? How about we start from the beginning, the germination of the project? I still remember very fondly that, um, how many years now? It's, more than Six, three. More than three, yes. Yeah. Six years ago, you invited me to join this project of uh, Chinese women's poems. Um, would you like to share a little bit about what your thought process of the, the project that you held dearly for more than six years in your mind, uh, right? Well, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I first uh, translated um, some Chinese Buddhist poets about 45 years ago with someone who was a uh, an Asian scholar, and I loved doing it. And we translated uh, Su Dongbo, Bo Chui, um, some Li Bo, Meng Hao Ran, et cetera. But um, the only woman that, uh, that we translated, and I have to say that I loved uh, translating her work more than anyone else, was Li Qing Zhao. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kenneth Rexroth, uh, you know, wonderful American poet, uh, had uh, translated a whole book of Li Qing Zhao's. So after we met, I I had this sort of idea in the back of my mind. Gee, I wonder, I wonder if Rebecca <laughs> will be willing to help bring some women poets from ancient China into the 21st century, because I would really love to do that. And so I think uh, what happened is I asked you, well, I told you, well, I had translated some Li Qing Zhao with uh, a friend. And um, and you said, oh, I love Li Qing Zhao. So I thought, OK, the connection is there. Mm -hmm. So then that's when I said, how about if we do um, how about if we do some women poets from from maybe Tang Dynasty or something 
uh, some time period like that. And and you you said, yeah, that would be a great thing to do. So that's how it that's how uh, this project actually began. Yeah, but, and what I really was interested in asking you because I never asked you this is. Were you holding these poets in your back pocket for the right moment, or did you discover them uh, in, in after the invitation, or how did you find them? Um, I've always known about Xue Tao and Yu Xuanji, more, like, more, more of Xue Tao because she's actually a very well-known poet. She's very famous. Her fame in China is on par with Li Ting Zhao. So uh -huh. the, the two of the most famous female poets will be Xue Tao and Li Ting Zhao. So I knew about her. Um, the rest I, I really discovered because you were like, oh, are there women writing? Are there anything? So okay, okay I'll do a quick search. And I don't know if you recall, my quick search showed up thousands and thousands of poems. Yeah. <laughs> From mythological times all the way until um, the, you know, the 20th, mid 20th century. Mm. People start writing in the new style of poetry. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> I know that um, <clears throat> what was exciting for me once we started thinking about it, and actually, you know, the translator, um, Red Pine, that many people know, in, in the endorsement uh, on the book cover, he wrote, I always wondered what was on the other side of China's poetry mountain. And that really, that really, and then he goes on with some lovely, gracious uh, words of praise. But uh, it, better to be a little modest about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, but um, this was really uh, a very a strong desire on my part to do it. I was so grateful when you said yes. And then when I started to see the poems, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, we, we really have something here. This is important. And as the project developed and we started to really work together and translate together, um, it became even more important because I realized these women were not just speaking for their for their lives as women and their time; they were also speaking for women now, and that uh -huh. was that was utterly shocking to me. But when yes. I think about it, when I think about the continuum of women's lives across male-dominated cultures, uh, it makes complete sense. Of course, what what was unique about them is that these women were Taoist practitioners, spiritual practitioners, and as well, um, they were deeply immersed in goddess culture. Yes, that's the exciting part. That, that part I had no idea about. I actually, I knew about these women, and I know they were, both, all, all three of them were branded as courtesans. Yes. Yeah, um, but that's how they were known. And as I started working on it, it was like, that doesn't make sense. Because Nidia, for example, was a, clearly a spiritual leader. Right? She was summoned to the court, to the imperial court, from, from a province to teach. And I've, if you know anything about the, the biographers of any spiritual leaders, take someone people might be familiar with, the sixth patriarch, for example. It was mm -hmm. written in his biography as a great honor that he was invited. And it, this happens with um, the narrative of many male leaders. Yes. So throughout history, it was like, why was she branded as a courtesan? So that, that really led me to do a lot of research and discover the goddess culture, which is very forgotten, actually. Yeah. And well, you know, in, in, in <clears throat> recent decades, and by recent decades, I'm going to say, let's say, go back 30, 40, 50 years in the West, um, there's been a great uh, sort of uh, um, archaeological dig of, uh, of uh, goddess culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Western goddess culture, and Maria Gimbutas is uh, probably maybe one of the most well-known uh, scholars who did this. Um, but the chance to find out about this in China, uh, in the Tang Dynasty, uh, oh. it's really, really quite startling. Now, you mentioned Li Ye, uh, who's one of our three poets, uh, Li Ye, mm -hmm. uh, Shui Tao, and uh, Yu Xuanji. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned her being summoned uh, to the court, and maybe this would be a good time to tell that story, because it's a it's an absolutely astonishing and painful story of one of our poets. Yes, it's it's really it's very tragic, and it really breaks my heart that two out of three poets were executed. Right, the public execution. Two out of three. Yeah, and yes, Lia was someone was wide, widely admired for talents and uh, in poetry and 
probably very likely Taoism from the way she presents herself in her poems. We have poems of her writing to you know high level ministers, chiding them pretty much as a as a teacher would chide a student, and uh, and so on and so forth. But she was summoned to the court because the emperor had heard about her and admired her talent. So she was invited to teach the inner inner palace. The inner palace is the uh, the harem of the of the emperors. But she was also a member of the male court, so she was. Uh, yeah, and she was she was invited to to teach the women in the harem, uh, the women in the palace court, and um, and they were she called them fragrant grasses, which I think is, <laughs> which is a, a wonderful phrase for them. Yeah. But uh, but then something really terrible happened, and maybe maybe I can tell, um, if you don't mind, unless you want to, maybe I can tell the people who are here what happened with her. Oh yes, feel free to to tell. And that if I, if it doesn't bore people, I can also tell what why there was a rebellion. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to give it away. So, um, so she she went to the court, and the emperor. I mean, the emperor of China invited this Taoist priestess uh, and this poet, a calligrapher, and she had many many talents to teach the fragrant grasses, as she called them. Um, uh, but during her time there. Uh, very shortly after uh, she got there, as, as near as I can tell, there was a rebellion against the emperor in China. And the rebellion went on and on and on. And Li was, uh, was quite frightened and uh, tried to hide, but she was captured by the rebels. And she was brought into the rebel camp. And while she was there, she was forced to write poetry in support of the leader of the rebel camp and the rebel and rebellion itself. Eventually, the emperor's uh, army put down the rebellion, and the emperor got a hold of the poems that she wrote that she was, uh, uh, you know, maybe under pain of death uh, in support of the rebellion. And he accused her of conspiring with the rebels. And even though she was Liye and she had been summoned by him with such praise, he had her put to death. And he had her executed. Yes. So such this a sad a, story. Such a tragedy. This is such a real, such a real tragedy. Maybe, maybe, um, what do you think? Maybe uh, we could read some of her poems so people have a feeling for her. I think that's a good idea. How about we read the poem of the, the Imperial Summons? Uh, the Summons? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me just uh, go to that page. Mm hmm. And uh, this is called After Receiving the Imperial Summons, Farewell to My Old Friends in Guanglin. Um, I'll say this, uh, the last lines of the poem talk about seagulls taking off freely from their shallow banks to meet in the sky. And uh, at the time, uh, the legend was that the immortals, the Taoist immortals, um, um, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, all of the animals there were white. So she's actually joining, um, you know, the animal world of the immortals at the end of this poem. But the first two lines of this poem absolutely stunned me. And uh, maybe it's because I'm getting older. Untalented and sickly, I ring the dragon bell of age. Yet my hollow, undeserving name has reached the emperor. Glancing up, I humbly place my ceremonial headpiece over my graying hair and with regret wipe the mirror clear to fix my fading complexion. Here, my mind darts through the northern palace gate following the fragrant grasses, eyes scanning the southern mountains to gaze at the ancient peaks. The cinnamon trees cannot keep this wild guest from leaving. Stand gulls take off freely from their shallow banks to meet in the sky. So this lets you see this dedicated Taoist priestess and poet saying goodbye to the world that she knows and has earned and that nurtures her spiritual life in order to serve at the emperor's summons. She may not have wanted to go, she called herself untalented and sickly. 
she talks about the dragon bell of age, and yet she goes, and within the year, she is executed. This is absolutely heartbreaking, as far so as- So tragic. And yeah, and we have actually uncovered some of her other poems through recent archeological finds in Dunhuang about her reflecting on this. We, did, we didn't end up translating it, the, the poem she wrote for the, for the rebel leader and really, and others who really express the regret of having to go and having to be mixed up. And yeah. this, in this team making, um, in the, and all of this, in this Game of Thrones, what were not? It's, it's very, Thrones, right. very, you know, she, very was, sad. she was such a pure practitioner. Um, I think maybe mm -hmm. some of the people who are uh, tuning in here in the audience uh, may be meditators. Uh, so maybe I can, uh, I read uh, Accidental Abiding, but um, because I think meditators will appreciate this poem. Uh -huh. And you can get a sense, a sense of her. I think she was really quite pure-minded, uh, uh, very clear-minded and very pure-minded, but also very, uh, very open and very vulnerable, which is one of the reasons that I loved her work. So, um, Rebecca, would you read the Chinese for uh, Accidental Abiding? Oh, yeah. Um, it goes like this. <clears throat> 心远浮云之不还 Oh, so great. Yes, you know, uh, something you might notice is the, uh, actually the way I read these poems, the, with the poem is different from everyday speech in Chinese. A little more different from the English poetry reading, which Peter just did and we're probably all familiar with, is that because these poems have, are so, such a, such a heritage, such a treasure, they're over 1300 years old, we have over time and they developed many different ways of presenting them. That's quite different from everyday speech. It's it's quite wonderful. And one of the, before I read the poem uh, in English um, or a translation of the poem, uh, one of the things that um, I want to say is that these are the words that the poet heard in her mind. She may not have heard them in the way that Rebecca just read, but you know that's uh, that's a way of honoring uh, the poem itself. Uh, the way Rebecca just read it is to give really a full expression to it. But it is amazing to me that we are able to read the very words that she wrote down 1,300 years ago. We have nothing like that, uh, even with uh, Chaucer and um, and Shakespeare and you know as people is there. We have nothing like that in English. So this is part of the real treasure for me of the book. Thank you. And the part of this, oh, sorry, before you're reading, I was just saying this is a very much of a living heritage because every Chinese child, most Chinese child from age three and on encouraged to recite poems like this, mm. older, as mm. a part of, as they learn, as we, we all learn how to speak. And, and, and are you taught to read it in that way? Not as a child, but gradually as a part of the uh, K-12 curriculum. I forgot where. Probably in middle school hmm. or early high school, people hmm. are taught to read this way. Okay, meditators. My mind is a distant drifting cloud. I know it won't return. It lives with clouds in the space between existing and the void. Why do gusting winds scatter it about, blowing back and forth from the southern to the northern mountains? I know that uh, many of you who meditate might ask that question of yourself. Why is my mind so scattered? <laughs> Just a moment ago, I was living in the clouds in that space between existing and the void. And now, <laughs> and I'm gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very candid, very, very real. Very real and so, so open, so true. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. <laughs> We mentioned the goddess culture. So one of the one of the things that's important to know, because this is Yin Mountain. Yin, as as people uh, probably know, is we always hear yin and yang, right? Yin and yang. Um, yin is the female principle. 
Um, it includes uh, that which is mysterious, that which is dark, that which is receptive, that which is moist, and it's completely associated uh, with the female or with the feminine uh, principle. And uh, in, in our introduction, we included um, just four lines from the Tao Te Ching that uh, addresses this. And I wanted to mention this because um, Taoist priestesses at this time um, were considered demigoddesses themselves. And uh, they were considered uh, persons that embodied the yin principle that was found in the Tao. This is very important. So uh, what is this yin principle? Well, you know, of course, I'm not going to be able to explain what the yin principle is. <laughs> you know, they say, right, the Tao that can be explained is not the eternal Tao. So we won't attempt to do that. But this is what's in the Tao Te Ching in translation. The valley spirit never dies. If you hear valley spirit, you can think immediately of those qualities of yin. The valley spirit never dies. It is called the mysterious female. The gateway of this mysterious female is the source of heaven and earth. So um, it's quite, quite something to say. This is the kind of power and the kind of respect that the Tao had for, uh, for the female principle. And for Taoist priestesses to be associated with this and to be considered embodiments of the yin principle is really quite something. When, uh, when Rebecca and I worked on this next poem, which is called A Song to the Spring of the Three Gorges, um, one of the things that we noticed was that while this poem could be seen as um, about playing music on a harp, uh, about the natural world, it's really deeply embedded in the legend um, of the goddess that lived over Wu Mountain. And this goddess, it was said, um, she was originally a, a young girl who died, who died quite young, and then she took, uh, she took uh, the form of the clouds over Wu Mountain. Right. And everyone... and, oh, and she was the daughter of the demigod, who, uh, the sage king who invented agriculture. Right. Yeah, and agriculture and the traditional medicine and all of that. And so, so fertility, fertility, yes, uh, was fertility. one of the major, major um, mm -hmm. parts of the yin principle. So, yes. so, so it, when we saw that, we thought, well, this poem also has quite a strong sensual and sexual um, uh, meaning to it. So, my original home is in the clouds over Wu Mountain where I often hear the mountains flowing spring waters, a tune that rises out of my jade harp and orbits through space, like the age old music I hear in my dreams. The three gorges that twist and turn for thousands of miles drift into my secluded chamber in an instant. Cliffs and boulders collapse beneath my fingers. Rushing waterfalls and crashing waves come alive from the strings of my harp. Is it a raging wind holding back thunder or the low moan of a river that cannot flow? Soon the strength of the roiling current will come to an end and return to the peaceful trickle of water dripping on flat sand. I recall the ancient times when Lord Ruan played this song and Zhang Rong just couldn't hear it enough. After playing this piece one time, I will play it again. May the music flow on like a never ending spring. This is perhaps maybe my favorite poem in the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so rich. It's so, I mean, her, her imagery is so gorgeous. Uh, her ability to embody uh, the yin principle, to take it into her own body, uh, to express it uh, through her experience as a woman. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I hope this doesn't bother anyone, but is it a raging wind holding back thunder or the low moan of a river that cannot flow? I mean, this is really extraordinary lyric as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I really love it. So I'm, I'm so glad we got to do, <laughs> do this. Uh -huh. Yeah, we discovered so much and it's so rich. Yeah. And including the whole um, spirituality of women until, yes. until, until Tang and uh, shortly after the demise of our last poet, Yu Xuanji, the, yeah. the whole religious movement turned almost 180 degrees. 
Yeah, maybe you could tell people what happened with the, with uh, the revisionists of uh, when Confucianism came in. Oh yes, to to it's I mean not it's not clear what exactly happened because Confucius is a long tradition too. Um, but anyways, shortly after the demise of Yuan Ji, Taoists turned celibate. So the and before then they, they were not celibate. They were uh, they actually worshipped femininity and reproductive reproductive powers. In, in ways like these, and um, I have we have some first-hand resources in the in the introduction and the word of the poet, but the evidence is clear that people really venerated these principles, the life-giving principles of the human body and the human experience. However, um, they really turned celibate, and people become very disturbed by their practices and by what what the story it tells and the power it beholds and um, and how it empowers, maybe how it empowers women. We, we don't know exactly what happened. It happened so long ago. But to a point that people almost forgot about this goddess culture or the goddess practices branch of Taoism. You know, it's so, it, what's, as I'm listening to you, Rebecca, what's really interesting to me um, as well is that the misogyny of the culture Mm -hmm. strong uh, as the Tang Dynasty came to a, uh, to an end and after Yu Xuanji's uh, uh, time period or the last of our, our, mm -hmm. of our poets um, that the revisionists used some of the most powerful and beautiful both spiritual and sensual sexual imagery of these poets as proof of their licentiousness yes. and they attempted to squash the reputation of these poets who were expressing their pure femininity, their pure spirituality, their pure connection to the goddess culture and the Tao. And what they did is, and you know, any you know, anything can be interpreted any way. What the what these revisionists in, in power did is they said, No, you see, those lines that you thought were great, no, actually, this is proof that these were promiscuous courtesans and prostitutes. Yeah, and one of the examples we just read is accidental abiding. That's right. Yeah, you really can't interpret anything anyway. No, no, absolutely right. So, um, uh, you know, hopefully uh, Li Ye is happy with our presentation today. I <laughs> hope so too. And um, there's uh, also quite a strong movement in China too, now with um, women being more um, empowered than ever. And then on, until then, any, any time after Tang Dynasty. And with more and with economic powers and so on, and um, people are getting interested in these poets as uh, as independent women. It's uh, you know uh, one of the things we haven't mentioned is that uh, that this certainly was not true of all women in China. I mean, it would be a mistake to think that. But this uh, class or caste of women, the Taoist priestesses, had a lot of freedom. They could marry or not. They could take lovers they could get divorced, isn't that right? Yes, they could get divorced. Yeah, they, yeah. Could. Yeah, mm -hmm. they could. And we have a poem, maybe, uh, Rebecca, how about Boudoir Lament in Spring? Would you read it in the Chinese? This is, okay. uh, this is the last poem I think we'll do of Li Ye, but um, it shows mm -hmm. the kind of freedom she felt uh, mm -hmm. to, to express herself as a young woman uh, and to even be kind of saucy and teasing, which uh, we might not think was true, but this is exactly the kind of thing that the revisionists wanted to squash. Mm -hmm. So I thought it's a very short poem, but I thought it would be nice for us to, to hear it. Would you read? Oh, yes, of course. It's, it's, very, it's a very important poem, too. It goes like this. Bai chi jing lan shang, shu zhi tao yi hong. You know, uh, maybe people are, are hearing it, but maybe not. There are end rhymes going on in, in these poems. Mm -hmm. So there is a, you know, there is a, a structure. This is not like a, a, a 20th century Western free verse. These are highly structured poems that come from, uh, from a culture that um, that revered poetry so much. And in fact, I'll mention this before reading the poem, because I, I think maybe we we can go to um, to um, either um, Yu Xuanji or, or Hawks soaring away. But um, um, these, 
the way these poets uh, wrote these poems was part of the long tradition of poetry. Poetry was so important in Tang Dynasty China that for someone who wanted to advance themselves and get a job in a ministerial position or administrative position or uh, 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 you know something like that, they would take the national exam. And those people who scored very highly on that exam could get jobs and they could support themselves. And if they were from a lower caste uh, in China at the time, um, they were able to step out of their caste and uh, move forward financially and socially, so it was very, very important. There's one problem. The exam was about poetry, but only men were allowed to take the exam. And one of our poets with deep, deep sorrow uh, rails against this, and I'll read that to you in a minute. First, let's hear Ali Ye with the poem that Rebecca uh, just uh, read so beautifully. Above the railing of a hundred foot well, peach branches have already budded red. Thinking of you far off by the harsh northern sea tosses me in the direction of intriguing men. That last line is so surprising. <laughs> She'd be crying, oh no, he went away. She's saying, he's gone. Let's see who else is around here. <laughs> you don't see you don't see many love poems like this at all. Not no. even rock and roll. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking. Definitely not. <laughs> so maybe uh, Rebecca, let's uh, let's go to Yushuanji to uh, touring the South Hall because I think this is. I agree. A yes, that's a natural flow. Yeah. So um, I just mentioned uh, I just mentioned about the. Um, um, the ability to increase your social and financial picture uh, in Tang China, uh, but um, only if you were a male. And so uh, this poem is called, it's, I, I love uh, Chinese poetry also because the, the, the titles are quite long. <laughs> Touring the South Hall of Chongjian Taoist Temple and reading the works of the new ministers. So these, uh, these, these new ministers were people who did well in their exams. And uh, what happened is that they would post the names of the uh, of the new ministers and the ranking um, uh, of those uh, of those men who uh, who did it, uh, who pa who uh, passed the exam highly, and um, and um, <clears throat> um, Yu Xuanji has a very strong reaction to it. So, would you read, please? Would you like me to read in the Chinese and we can? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, maybe it's maybe. Do you think it's better if we tell a little bit about Yu Tianji's story? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, so yeah. far our, our um, audience have heard pretty very little about her. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, I really admire Yi's poem. They're all great poems. But personally, I relate to Yu Tianji the most. Well, because I haven't lived to the advanced age of uh, Li Ye and Xu Tao yet. Um. But yeah, she was, she has really a tragic life because she was born to the commoner caste in the city. But she nonetheless received a poetry education. One of the reasons probably is because poetry is everywhere. And another reason is that um, her family may have been landlords to the tenants and, and the tenants or likely the minister, the people trying to be join the minister class working mm. on these exams. And they would a lot of times they would go and live in Chang'an, rent rent uh, local houses, and then network and uh, do do what they need to do. And uh, from there, there she might have received her poetry education. Mm -hmm. And from there, she probably also met her her love, the love of her life, yes. whom she married to when she was of the marriageable age. I think she was 15, right? She was 15, yes. And but the marriage quickly fell apart because another custom of the time is that those ministers, those men who scored well in this exam will become prized sign laws of the arist aristocracy. And her husband scored the first in, in the exam, which is a great something to celebrate, but it's also the start of Eugene's tragedy. Yes. Is that he was arranged into a marriage with an uh, with aristocratic first wife. So she had to become a second wife 
which has the social status of somewhat of a sex, sex slave. You know, a lot of times second wives were treated as uh, servants and they were subject to legal but painful abuses, mutilation, and beating. Horrific treatment by both the first wife and the, the husband. And in, in her case, it seems uh, from what we've learned, the first wife, mm -hmm. her husband's first wife, which was an arranged marriage. So I, we can't say whether there was love there or not. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the love of, uh, of uh, Yushuanji's life. But uh, she apparently abused, uh, was, was really um, uh, very jealous of their very relationship. Jealous, yes. And so she, she abused Yushuanji uh, as well. You yes. can imagine the irony of being Yu Xuanji, this incredible poet, and having your husband score first on the exam that you were not allowed to go near. And as a result of that, had a life of abuse and, and sorrow. Yes. And, yeah, and she was forced to divorce, probably either forced or willingly divorced and become a Taoist priestess as a result of the falling apart of the first marriage or this highly abusive marital system yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, her story is quite tragic i mean her ending, tragic. Her, her ending is quite tragic do you want to say uh sure yeah maybe we can we can sum it up since we're talking about it yeah. and uh at, while being a taoist priestess she was admired while widely for her her appearances and for her talent it was said that uh, the the members of the entire court who puff themselves up to win her favors. And by doing so, she probably made enemies. And uh, when she was 25, she was accused of murdering her servant, her maid, who was also um, uh, that priestess of the same, of the same nunnery, of the same convent. But they was shrouded in mystery. For example, one thing that really struck me something is off is that the body of the her supposed victim was discovered a few months after the supposed murder. And it was said that the victim's body looked as if it was alive. <laughs> they dug it up, didn't think too much, and put Yu Xianji in jail and tried her for murder. And then she was, she was executed. Yes, and the, there was outcry in the court and she was executed. One thing actually I didn't even tell Peter is later I found out that the, the judge who executed her a few years later was found out of um, corruption, of taking bribes oh. and committed suicide because of it. Mm. Very tragic. There's likely something terrible going on. Yeah, what a time. Yes, what a time. So this is, uh, this is our translation. Um, I'll mention there is an image of clear brutal hooks the clear brutal hooks um are uh, about the the form of the characters that were written uh, by the men uh you know uh writing the poetry but our, our feeling is that the clear brutal hooks is also uh a uh, a um a statement about the culture itself Cloud peaks fill my eyes, banishing the light of spring. Clear, brutal hooks form beneath their fingers. I hate that my poems must hide beneath my woman's robes. I lift my head in vain and envy the names of their honorees. It's such a painful poem. It's such a painful poem and such, such a tragic life. How about we read some, would you mind reading some other poems by Yu Xunji? Maybe the, the subsequent one, River Travel, to lighten it up a little bit and show her spirit instead of just her, just her yep. tragedy. Well, what about, the, what about the response to Li Ying's invitation to go fishing? Oh yeah, that's a good one. That, that, that one is so much humor. Yes. Yeah, yeah, this one is, you know, again, so she feels very, very uh, free to, mm -hmm. you know, to, uh, uh, to say what she says. Yes. So this is um, response to Li Ying's invitation to go fishing on a summer day. So somebody asked her out on a date, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and her response was, though we live in the same lane, 
year after year, our paths don't cross. Casual conversation may soften an older woman, while fragrant osmanthus bends the fresh boughs. But the Tao's essence dupes both ice and snow, and Zen mind just laughs at finery and silk. Although traces of you have climbed clear to the Milky Way, there is still no pathway to me through the mist and waves. <laughs> so I would say that's a round rejection. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, shall we, we, we're moving out of time. Shall we go to um, Shui Tao? Uh, yes, Hawk let's, Thor in the way? let's read Hawk Thor in the way and share a little bit of that. Yeah. That, that's well, quite important. Yeah. 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 Why don't you maybe, maybe speak about her a little bit and this poem. Oh, yes, yes, the background is, is quite something. Is this poem is actually one of the poems. Uh, she, she wrote 10 poems like this, Hawk Soaring Away, in, as a part of a, a love saga of hers with a very famous male poet called Yuan Jin. Yuan Jin is not famous, not very famous in the English speaking culture. I don't think he's, I think he's famous at all, mm. but he's, he's quite an important figure. He was known as an equal with Bai Juyi during his lifetime, and has uh, pioneered many ways of new ways of writing poems and so forth. Bai Juyi, just so people know, Bai Juyi is uh, a, a, another name for Libo. No, no, no. For, uh, oh. Li, Li Bai is Libo. Oh, Li Bai. Bai yeah. Juyi is uh, maybe Bo Chuyi. Oh, Bo Chuyi, that's right. Yes, Bo Chuyi, yes. And so, that. yes, so he is a very important poem and really is a seminal poet. Yes. And uh, um, Xue Lao being a courtesan was necessarily involved with a lot of uh, ministers. And Yuan Jin was on his ministerial career. He later became the prime minister of China. Mm. And this is part before he became prime minister, they had um, they have a love affair. And uh, because for whatever reason, we don't know it fell apart tem temporarily. And Xue Lao wrote 10 poems to express her complex feelings hmm. in, in all of this. And uh, and this is one of them. And this is this is actually one of the only poem in this entire collection was received positively throughout hmm. history. This hmm. this 10 parting poems, as they call it, is um received positively throughout history by the um male dominated Confucian literary critique critics. Hmm. So yeah. And so, uh, Without, she left about five, we still about, about 500 poems, yeah? Yes, she did. She had, she had a successful career and lived on lived into her old age. She yeah. retired into her, her country estate, practiced art and wrote poems and uh, practiced Taoism until, until her, and received, received, received visitors associated with her friends freely until mm. the end of her days. Well, let's hear. Okay, yeah. Um, so it's called Yin Li Go. Okay, Yin is hot. So it goes like this. Zhao Li Lu Feng Ye Si Ling, Ping Yuan Zhuo Zhu, Cheng Gao Qing, Wu Dun Cuan Xiang, Qing Yun Wai, Bu De Er Jin, Shou Shang Qing. So we translate the title as hawk, you know, the bird, hawk soaring away. With my talon spears and bell-like eyes, my capturing of hairs is praised by all. But since I soared above the blue clouds for no reason, you no longer let me perch on your arm. To me, this is uh, such an important line because she's saying, while I have been admired and praised by everyone, simply, because I soared above the blue clouds, because I went off into my imagination, possibly, for no reason, which means for not, no reason you understand, you have punished me, and you no longer let me uh, be with you. But the way she said it, perch on your arm, like an object, like a bird, right, on mm -hmm. its master's arm, is a real condemnation, I think, of... Uh, uh, of that part of their relationship, uh, mm -hmm. of his abuse of power over her. Um, 
maybe I'm very aware of the time that David gave us, so maybe um, we should end with uh, Shweta with uh, the old style poem on page 82. Yes, let's do that to give more um, more context of her relationship with uh, with her lover and yes. her life, and then we can probably open up to question and answers. I'm, I'm I'm eager to hear what the, the audience wants to ask. So this is sending an old style poem to Wei Qi, and um, I th I think this is a very beautiful poem, and it really shows Shui Tao's, uh, uh, you know, great 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 uh, <clears throat> expression. Yes, and uh, before we go, Wei Zhi is also Yuan Zhen. He has he goes by two names. He refers to him by a more intimate name. Yeah, same same man. Yeah, same man. Everyone knows your writing, music, and way, but only I know the fine wind and light of your being. While describing flowers on a moonlit night, we were tender in the peaceful dark. On rainy mornings, we chanted beside each other about willows that leaned so close. For so long, I was taught to hide myself like precious emerald jade, but I always wrote on red paper that you'd carry by your side. Now that I'm old, not able to get things done, let me confess only to you, I wish I'd been able to have raised a son. What a what a way to end <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as an old woman now. Mm -hmm. We had all of this. Mm -hmm. But yes. I still had I still had a certain desire. That's right. And something about the relationship is Shui Tao was actually 10 years older than Yuan Jing. Which is it's, it's quite an age gap, even nowadays, mm. between women between men and women, but but back then too. Yeah. So, David, are, are we, uh, there you are. <laughs> this has been absolutely wonderful tonight. Um, thank you both so much. Thank uh, you. It's gorgeous. Uh, we've got a few questions already from our audience. Uh, so what happens if you don't plan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, spontaneity is great, right? <laughs> um, There's a question here from Martin. He says, uh, what does Yu Jing Yi mention both Dao and Zin? and her rejection of the invitation to go fishing. Yeah, so Rebecca, you can say uh, what was going on at the time in, this, in the spiritual practices uh, uh, at, in her, uh, <clears throat> in um, uh, Yu Xuanji's time. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's very, it's, it's a fascinating thing because Yu Xuanji pretty much lived at the, the golden age of Zen, as we know it, that period in China. And uh, and then become the term Zen has become more and more more and more of um, of an everyday vocabulary that it is now to express general spirituality. But uh, an interesting thing to note is that it was not the case during the year's lifetime. Right. So we really had a, a lot of change in Buddhism going on as as a background, and that influenced the Chinese language tremendously because. Then Buddhism or Chan, as we call it in China, has really influenced a lot of expressions of cultural expressions and spiritual expressions in the Chinese language. They both existed. Buddhism was, you know, Taoism was there and had come from a long period for a long, long time, thousand years or something um, before. Um, but, and Buddhism was coming in uh, at the same time. And Zen was developing. And this is, as Rebecca said, this was really the golden age of, for those of us who are, you know, practicing Zen Buddhists. I mean, the, the Zen teachers at the time were really, really, really very strong. And, um, and, you know, we know about them. Uh, so I think she was, in a way, she was saying, uh, there's no way you're getting to me, not through this door, and not through that one either. <laughs> So maybe yeah. that's maybe that will answer the question a little bit. Thank you for your question. Oh, thank you all. Uh, there's a question here from Lee. Um, they say, what about the fragrant grasses? How many of them wrote poetry on par with three these three Taoist women? We actually have a lot of poems, surviving so poems by these princesses and um, women of the court. A lot of them are uh, imperial princesses and queens. A lot of emperors, empresses, 
write role poems too that we have discovered. They do not form a, a collection that's already not translated. And mm. some of them, the poems are actually quite strong, as strong and suggestive as the poems we have in this volume. Definitely more su suggestive than accidental abiding. Mm -hmm. There's a poem I came across from just a few, let me think, a few generations before the year. By, by a woman who later on become honored as the sage emperors of China. And it was much more explicit. Is that right? It, it is. And it, it really shows what had turned, which women get branded as courtesans and which branded as sage queens. It's really <laughs> very little to do with your poetic expression. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's likely that there's quite, there's quite a, a tome of, <clears throat> Uh, of poetry by the so-called fragrant grasses mm -hmm. um, uh, you know she the, the, the phrase is so great but you know fragrant grasses you know young grass you know so green uh so fragrant so moist uh you know this was i think this was uh, Lier's uh, way of saying oh you know these these young women they're the ones i'm going to see now even though i'm old i'm gonna go there I, I I love the phrase myself. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There's a, a question here from Shirley. She asks, "How did you address the musicality of the English translation uh, when the original had such intense rhythm and rhyme?" Impossible. <laughs> 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 well, we we try. Right? We we still try. We really pay attention to the musicalities and the meters and. Uh, and the rhythm of the English language, but it's the language itself is so different. Yeah, you know, I um, in my life as a translator, I, I said once that uh, uh, the act of translation is the act of tra uh, traumatizing two languages at the same time. <laughs> so, um, and this is really the case. We can't make the sounds of Chinese in English. So that's the first thing. So, you know, prosody, the musicality of a poem, um, has to do with the sounds, it has to do with the pacing, it has to do with the cadence, it has to do with the rhythms, uh, it has to do with the phrasing, and this is how it comes about. So what we tried to do, and I don't know if you could hear it in, in such a quick uh, presentation, but what we tried to do is honor the fact that in Chinese, the prosody was quite strong by creating a, a form for the poems, which uh, doesn't it doesn't do what many translations from Chinese do uh, uh, what uh, Chinese uh, have done, which is to go to the automatic left line um, margin. We created a kind of spacing and um, and pacing uh, through the poem to give the sense of movement and the sense of aliveness and the sense of freedom, as well as uh, in the poem in English to honor what was going on in the Chinese, uh, but also uh, we 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 worked on this in a way we you know we we change the forms basically so sometimes a four line poem might be eight lines on the page and we did that to emphasize uh, the phrasing which would bring out the lyricism of the poems and then the last part is that uh, in translating really paid attention to the way the sounds were working in English so even though they weren't uh, they weren't exact. Uh, copies, so to speak, or miming uh, of what was going on Chinese, at least English readers will have a sense that this is a musical form, that the, pro the prosody and the lyricism is very important to the poem, even though it wasn't A for A, B for B. That, that would be impossible. We just can't do that from Chinese to English, much less Tang Dynasty Chinese to English, <laughs> which is quite different. Yes, and uh, part of the poems that, you know, in four short lines, sometimes in the original, you know, 20, 20 some sounds that capture so much with imagery and history, allusion and references to nature and spirituality. So we really decided to lean into the imagery and the metaphors and, and so forth while working with the English language, respecting English, English in its own way to create uh, the musicality, recreate. We wouldn't say recreate, to try to somewhat express the musicality as Peter has just described. Yeah, so for example, in the poem, the last poem I just read, 
um, just to, to give a sense of, of it. The last three lines are, now that I'm old, not able to get things done, let me confess only to you, I wish I'd been able to have raised a son. So you can hear the rhyming of the end lines there. And that, that was, you know, was really specifically chosen to sort of honor um, what the Shui Tao had done in, in her poem, even though it's not the sounds she made. Traductore, traditore, um, <laughs> translator, uh, traitor. Thanks so much. That, that actually brings up a question that I had, which you guys have kind of uh, um, touched on and which Ian kind of asks as well, I'm going to sort of blend these two together, which is to talk a little bit about your process of, of collaboration and translation. Ian said in a, in a, in a question, uh, this is sort of recanted in the Q&A, if you could talk a little bit about what forms they were using. And so I'm kind of curious about, about that, if y'all could expand a little bit about how you, uh, how you sort of dealt with the, these sounds. Hmm. So Rebecca, maybe you can explain about the five and seven line form and, you know. Sure. Yes, so uh, most of them were done in a form of poems called regulated verse. So when there are four lines, they will be what we call jueju. And when there are eight lines, we call them lu shi. And they are, uh, they so they, they're highly regulated and uh, they're either like four lines of five sounds, four or five sounds, or seven or five sounds or seven sounds like that for the for the poets to work with. And um, and a lot of times because Chinese is a tonal language, right? And the contemporary Mandarin is five tones, whereas Tang Chinese has the, something about nine tones. And so that it gives you a musical scale. So they're actually musicality ton tonal requirement within the lines and across the lines of how they're supposed to end, where they're supposed to go. So they, they, they are very structured form of poem. And uh, Li, Li is one of the trailblazing poets who worked with her contemporaries to really cement and exemplify the, this style of poetry. Like one, one of the reasons that they, that they had such strong reputations is that they were staying with the regulated verse of the time. It's not like the women had one form and the men had another form. The women said, okay, this is the form. Okay, here's what we're going to do with it. And it's quite different uh, uh, in content uh, that of what the men was doing, uh, were doing, but not in terms of the tonality uh, within the lines. So there was, uh, there was the traditional structure uh, of the lines and of the poems. And then there was the nature of the content, which was quite different uh, for the these uh, three Taoist uh, poets uh, and, and others, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. They really opened that door uh, yes. in many ways, because the men were not talking about this. They were talking about different things. Yes, and it might be surprising for people with for English speakers that there's still creative freedom in a style poetry that's so structured. It's because Chinese language is so different in a way that every sound has its own meaning, independent meaning. You can really put a lot of meanings together within very few phonies, as you say it. And the rhyming is also different. The, the way Chinese rhymes has a lot, Chinese has a lot of homophones. It's a lot easier to rhyme than English. You know, sometimes uh, in, in, in our process of uh, <clears throat> working together, um, uh, Rebecca would say to me, this character does mean this word that you say it means. It does mean that. However, uh, it, it is, it's a homophone with another word that brings a different interpretation to the word that you want to use. And actually, that interpretation is a little more important than the word that you've come up with. So let's find a way to say that. And so we, we, our, our process included a constant correction uh, you know, and conversation between us. Uh, and Rebecca was really, you know, phenomenal, I have to say, really spectacular in making it clear to me that while it's true that my understanding of this character is, it means this, that's not quite right. There's something else going on because of the sounds within the tonality, within the lines that we have to address because that is what the poet wanted. So this was, uh, I mean, always eye-opening, <laughs> I have to say. Well, uh, 
I'm afraid we're out of time. Rebecca, Peter, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you both so much. What a wonderful evening. Um, the book is Yin Mountain. You can order it from Northshire.com. There you go. The chat or in the chat. <laughs> it's straight out by your I background. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Maybe Rebecca has one. I don't know. Maybe I'll try. It's, no, <laughs> no, it's, it's just also my painting. I left, Technology. I left my in the office, uh, or I put it up right now. Well, thank you both so much, and um, everyone have a wonderful evening, and uh, go forth with these wonderful poems ringing in your ears. Thank you for thank having you all me. so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for hosting this wonderful event, and thank you for having us. Okay. Bye, Jen. Take good care. Bye, Jen. Bye, bye. Bye, Jen.